Hello everyone, welcome uh, to the 15th episode of uh, Math and Beyond, Analysis Podcast. Today, we are going to talk with uh, Jessica Tarna. Uh, she's an assistant professor of uh, theoretical physics at the University of uh, Durham, at the Durham University in, uh, in UK. She did her postdoc uh, research at the uh, Fermilab uh, in the United States. And she did, um, yeah, she has her PhD uh, from uh, Durham University. Again, today we are going to talk about uh, uh, neutrinos. So, yeah, I'm going to send uh, the invite uh, and I will see you shortly. Let me just. Um, hi, Jessica. Hi, hi, Francesco. Let me just move all the, the junk yeah. on my. Yes, don't worry. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that was in the frame. How are you? Ah, I'm fine. I'm great. Yeah, there is a lot of uh, uh, good, uh, lovely sunshine days, uh, sun, sunny days uh, in Amsterdam these days. But yeah, what about you? Yeah, I mean, here we're also having this like incredibly sunny weather for um, the UK. <laughs> so <laughs> it's actually very pleasant. Uh, <laughs> where, you are, uh, where are you at the moment? Uh, I'm in Durham um, which is I, I work at Durham University so I live just outside yep. of Durham and uh, I decided to stay at home and work today um, okay okay I gave yes I gave a small introduction about you indeed uh, before and um, and it said that uh, you obtained your uh, PhD from uh, Durham uh, University yep. you went on uh, to postdoc studies at uh, Fermilab in mm-hmm. the United States and mm-hmm. you are now covering the position of uh, st- assistant professor in theoretical physics uh, at uh, the Durham University. Yeah, Is that that's right? perfect. Yeah, great. Great. Okay. Yeah, I said I introduced. Uh, I got a small introduction about uh, the topic. I, I just said we were uh, about to talk about um, uh, talk about neutrinos. So there's a lot to say. I think so. I would say that we can uh, jump uh, into it. And I would like uh, I would like to ask you first. Uh, um, where can we find? Firstly, where can we find the neutrinos? Because maybe these, uh, sometimes with some topic, uh, especially if you discuss a particle, uh, I have been discussing uh, the Higgs boson uh, with, um, with a PhD student uh, from the ATH of Zurich. And I, I, I want to give uh, firstly the feeling that people, uh, why do we want to care uh, about this particle, uh, which we maybe never uh, do not see, but why do we want to care? So where can we find neutrinos first? Okay, so maybe I, can I share my screen, Francesco? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, excellent, thank you. So I've got a little slide. So where can we find neutrinos? Well, neutrinos are very ubiquitous. They're all over the place. So the sun produces very many neutrinos. Um, There are trillions of them arriving on Earth every second. Um, In addition, in the early universe, neutrinos were generated just seconds after the Big Bang. And everywhere in the universe, for every cubic centimeter, there are about 300 of these neutrinos that were produced just seconds after the Big Bang. So we're really moving through a bath of ancient neutrinos and a bath of neutrinos from the sun. Uh, Also, there are neutrinos produced in the upper atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, So for instance, when cosmic rays hit the Earth's atmosphere, essentially neutrinos are generated and streamed towards us. These are called atmospheric neutrinos. Um, So in essence, every time you fuse together atoms uh, such as nuclear fusion that happens in the sun, or any time you break apart an atom, such as in radioactive decay, you will produce neutrinos. So there are very many sources of neutrinos. Uh, Even our bodies produce quite some neutrinos from various different radioactive decays that happen in like heavy atoms in our body. And in fact, a banana would produce 13 neutrinos every second because bananas have quite a lot of potassium. Um, And we can also make neutrinos from um, protons so we can have man-made neutrinos. So in essence, neutrinos are extremely ubiquitous in the universe, and they come from very, very many sources. So that's one reason I think we ought to be quite interested in them. Okay, okay. And why why do we, they why were they first uh, generated? Let's say postulated by we call by Wolfgang Pauli. Why and when? 
Why and when? Okay, so like at the start of the 1900s, there was lots of discoveries by Rutherford. So Rutherford discovered the alpha uh, particle, which is basically a helium nucleus. He discovered gamma rays, which are energetic photons. And finally, he discovered the beta particle, which we know to be an electron now. And this was discovered in beta decay. So beta decay basically happens when you have a neutron inside an atom it can decay to a proton and electron. This is what was thought at the time. So what you would expect is that if the neutron in the atom was decaying to a proton and electron, then they knew roughly the mass of the atom before and after the decay. So the electron should carry all of the kinetic energy uh, di difference between the atom before the decay and after the decay. So the electron, given this information, would have had an almost like single kinetic energy, which Rutherford would be able to measure. But he didn't measure that. What he actually measured was the electron could have really a wide range of kinetic energy, which was very surprising. So it was actually Pauli who in 1931 postulated that there must be another particle. It is a spin half particle. So we call it a fermion. It has no electric charge and it's very, very light. And this particle, he dubbed the neutrino, would carry away the rest of the kinetic energy that the electron couldn't. Um, so it was really the continuous energy spectrum of the electron from the beta decay uh, that caused Pauli to make this postulation of the neutrino. Um, and he actually thought he did something very bad because he thought he postulated the existence of a particle that would never be discovered. Um, so, but it wasn't until 1956 that Rains and Cowens actually discovered the, the neutrino uh, in, in, uh, in the US. So by discovering, I mean they detected neutrinos from a fission reactor through the interaction of the neutrinos with uh, their detector. So, so it was in 1931 Pauli first discovered the neutrino, or yeah. first postulated the neutrino, I should say. OK. How was let's say, yeah, what was what was the detection of the neutrino difficult to, uh, to accomplish? The detection is generally very difficult to accomplish. So the reason the detection is difficult to accomplish is because the neutrinos, as I said, they're electrically neutral. So what that means is they don't interact with photons. They are also not having charge under the strong nuclear force. So the only force of nature they interact with is what we call the weak nuclear force. Um, so for instance, they can interact with the Z boson and the W boson, which are force carriers of the weak nuclear force. So the weak nuclear force, as the name suggests, is very weak. So in essence, neutrinos interact with ordinary matter, such as detectors, in a very, very weak way. So the detection really, you know, it really requires a lot of neutrinos over time in order to observe the detection. So for instance, to illustrate this, neutrinos, there are very many neutrinos um, produced in the sun, but one of these solar neutrinos produced in the sun, it would have to travel through approximately 1 trillion people before it would interact with a single person. So that should illustrate how weakly interacting the, the neutrinos are. So it's very difficult to detect them. Okay, can I can I go a bit back to let's say that let's say the role uh, of the of the of the role of the neutrino within uh, the standard model? You already mentioned that uh, that they do not interact uh, uh, with photons. Uh, what else? Uh, let's say what what is their place within the standard model? So. I was asked a question by a student. Uh, he said, you know, what's the point of these particles? <laughs> like, I was like, well, you know, studying them is fascinating because they're all around us all the time and we really don't know many of their properties. But I, I would say like first their purpose is that if they didn't exist, you couldn't have nuclear fission and nuclear fusion occurring. And those particular processes are fundamental to the formation of stars and the generation of heavy elements that subsequently lead to life. So I would say neutrinos are in, sure. in, in their role. Their role in the standard model is they are spin half particles, um, like the quarks 
and the charged leptons. So quarks include um, essentially the up and down quarks, which make protons and neutrons, which obviously make atoms and elements and therefore us. Um, but the, unlike the quarks or the charged leptons, the neutrinos don't have mass within the standard model. So they are okay. massless spin half weakly interacting particles in the standard model. Okay. But we know that neutrinos, as you're going to ask later, they actually do have mass. So the standard model, which is our model of describing fundamental particles and the forces that govern those fundamental particles, does not give us an explanation for why neutrinos have masses. Okay. And you mentioned uh, before, I don't remember whether it was this uh, uh, detail, uh, but uh, when I was I say, getting some uh, reading uh, uh, for about neutrino, I something that was very much uh, recurring uh, was the fact that neutrino for a long time they have been tried to, yeah, they have been investigated uh, if uh, they resembled uh, my a Majorana nature, um, mm -hmm. yes, of, of the of the particle of the neutrino. Um, can you tell us about what is a Majorana particle? Uh, why a neutrino was uh, being associated uh, with um, the Majorana particle, uh, and uh, how do we find actually? How do we inspect uh, if the neutrino is uh, a Majorana particle? Okay, that's a really good question. So, firstly, I'll contrast with other particles we are very familiar with. Um, in order to establish how neutrinos may be Majorana. So there are other you know, constituent particles that we know, so the quarks and charged leptons. And those particles have electric charge. So an electron has a charge of minus one and the positron has a charge of plus one. So we can identify the electron, we can map it to its antiparticle in an obvious way. So the antiparticle of an electron is a positron because it's got the opposite electric charge. Um, just, and it, this also works for the quarks. So for instance, the up quark has a charge of plus two thirds and the anti-up has a charge of minus two thirds. And these are what we call Dirac particles because there is a meaningful way we can distinguish the particle from the antiparticle. Now, the particle and the antiparticle, when they meet, they annihilate. So what I mean by annihilation is that when an electron and a positron collide, they can form a Z or a photon, right? Now, the question is, are neutrinos Dirac, like the charged leptons and quarks, or are they Majorana? Um, so neutrinos could be like charged leptons or quarks in the... Um, they could be Dirac. So what that means is the neutrino and the anti-neutrino are com completely, completely, uh, completely different from each other, right? In some meaningful way. However, because the neutrinos don't have electric charge, what could happen is they could be Majorana particles. And what this means is that you can identify the neutrino and the anti-neutrino as being equivalent. And okay. this can only happen if you don't have an electric charge. And the neutrinos, they're special because they don't have an electric charge. So it could be that um, essentially the neutrino and the anti-neutrino are equivalent. Okay, so how do we find out? Like, how, say, how do we tell? Uh, so is it a neutrino? <laughs> you say, okay, is it a neutrino or an anti-neutrino? Uh, how do we say? Okay, so, well, how do you tell if neutrinos are Majorana? Well, if they're Majorana, as I said, you can identify the neutrino and the anti-neutrino. But what this really means is that how we would label a neutrino is normally having a lepton number of um, plus one, right? So a lepton is, is a class of particles that we know. For instance, the electron is a lepton because there are certain quantum numbers or certain properties it has that we ascribe it to be a lepton. Neutrinos are also leptons because they can interact with um, charged leptons through a weak interaction. So a neutrino has a lepton number of plus one. The anti-neutrino, if neutrinos are Dirac, would have a lepton number of minus one. 
Now, if neutrinos are Majorana, then these lepton number, which is a number we ascribe to a neutrino versus an antineutrino, no longer has any meaning because we've identified the neutrino and its antineutrino counterpart. So if neutrinos are Majorana, then lepton number would be violated. So the way experimentalists are searching to answer this question is they're searching for lepton number violating processes. Um, so I can describe a little bit what that is from these diagrams. Okay. So here in the upper diagram, we have the usual beta decay. So we have a neutron decaying to a proton, an electron, an electron antineutrino. And inside a really big atom, like a germanium atom or a xenon atom, you might also get another beta decay occurring, right? So this is called two beta decay. Now, if neutrinos and antineutrinos are distinct from each other, then essentially lepton number is conserved in the entire process. So there are no leptons initially because neutrons are not leptons. And in the final, in the final manifestation of this decay, the total lepton number on the right-hand side is also zero because we get like essentially plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. Now, if neutrinos are Majorana, you would actually get neutrino less double beta decay because here the neutrino and the antineutrino can actually annihilate on each other because they're equivalent. So what would actually happen is that you would see two electrons coming out from this double beta decay and no neutrinos. So the experimentalist would essentially see a little, um, um, almost a monochromatic or a single energy for the outgoing electrons. So, so this is what the experimentalists are searching for this lepton number violating process, which would be an indication that neutrinos were Majorana. Okay. Now, we've not observed these lepton number violating processes, but there are many experiments going on at the moment searching for this. And this would be a, a definitely a Nobel Prize, like if this was discovered. Okay, okay. Always what, what strikes me the most uh, when I'm, uh, if I'm talking with the PhD students or uh, they are related when they, when they talk about, for example, cosmology or yeah, some other universe, let's say related, the uh, history of the universe related stuff, I would say, ah, come on, this is, a, this is a story, this kind of a story, it's easy to remember, let's say, at least for me, mm -hmm. it's, easy to it's a story. But when it comes to the standard model, I interviewed a guy, um, a PhD student, from about the standard model uh, and the Higgs boson, uh, all these numbers and interaction, all these properties within the standard model, I am like, what, how do you remember that? I think you remember all of these uh, <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> I suppose you get you get used to it, right? Like you're like, okay, quarks, they're strongly interacting. Particles, they're strongly bound. We only observe like essentially bound states of the quarks because they interact strongly. Um, and like charged particles interact with photons and stuff. Um, probably weak interactions are definitely less familiar to people unless they know a bit about radioactivity. But yeah, this is this is what we are made of, right? Ultimately, at the end of the day, right? At the smallest scales. We better we better be knowing it, right? Yeah. Well, ideally, we would like to know it. And what's more scary, I think, is that this is only four percent of the whole universe. Yeah, but okay. Now we, that's we, the we, terrifying we come, thing. We will talk about that later. Don't, yes. Uh, don't spoil it at the moment. We will come. Uh, no we will spoilers. Come no spoilers. Yes. So now I I wanted to ask you. You mentioned before about um. That we had some sort of a yeah, problem with the mass uh, of the of the of the neutrino, and I would like to ask you, uh, what was wrong with it? Why did we think uh, they were massless, and how did we find out uh, they actually were not? Because uh, just by reading, you can see that this finding uh, was quite important. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was uh, a Nobel Prize again. Uh, <laughs> it was very important indeed. So. I'll come to the first question, what's wrong with the neutrino mass? Um, so wrong is quite subjective, but let me, <laughs> I, I think you're probably right in using that word. So as I, I was talking about spin half particles, um, th these are kind of the constituents of ordinary matter, right? So protons and neutrons are made of quarks, which are spin half particles, and um, atoms have essentially protons and neutrons and electrons, which are also spin half particles. Now, if we can compare how massive these spin half particles are. So the heaviest quark, the top quark, um, if we took, in, let's say, an animal to represent its mass, it would be a blue whale, right? 
Okay. Now, we have electrons, which was around atoms. The mass of an electron in this animal spectrum is a, a bunny rabbit. So it is really small yeah. compared with a blue whale, but it's still a mammal, right? Yeah. Now, if we continue using animals as an analogy for the mass of fundamental particles, then the neutrino is a blue bottle fly. Okay. Now, <laughs> it's not, you can't even find a mammal that's that light. That, so I would say that's what's wrong with the neutrino mass. It is so light compared with all the other fundamental particles we know about. Like that yeah. is what bothers people, okay? Um, so yeah, it's not even a mammal on the scale. Now, um, the second so basically, question- basically the problem was that we couldn't find uh, a good analogy to explain the neutrinos. So that, that's why it was bothering us. <laughs> it bothers us. Yeah, like we have, as physicists or theoretical physicists, we have, you know, a very sophisticated way of calling this fine tuning. You know, this is so finely tuned. This is such a tiny mass. It keeps us up at night. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's yeah, there's no good analogy for why it should be so small, at least in this animal descriptor. Now, we thought it was massless for a long time because when we talked about the beta decay, so the neutron decaying to the proton, the electron, and the electron antineutrino, the electron, as uh, Rutherford initially observed, could have a lot of different energies, right? Um, so it could almost have all of the energy that was the difference in the mass between the proton and the neutron. So whatever was carrying away the, the remainder of the energy, i.e. the neutrino, it must have been very light. Because if it was very heavy, then the electron, it couldn't have such a large kinetic energy some of the time in the decays. Um, so it was, thought, it was thought that neutrinos would have to be massless for this to be the case. So for many years um, from the discovery, of uh, beta decay up till the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which we'll discuss in a moment, it was thought neutrinos were massless, essentially. Okay. And yeah, why, how did we say, how did we discover that they actually were not? Okay, maybe I can share my screen again. Um, So the discovery of neutrino oscillations, uh, well, the discovery of neutrino oscillations actually indicated neutrinos had mass. So maybe I can quickly describe how we discovered neutrinos oscillate, or shall I? Maybe I should discuss what I mean by neutrino flavor. Um, yeah, so let's first uh, let's first uh, get into the flavor of a neutrino, which I believe may then later help us in uh, understanding a neutrino oscillation. Yes. Okay, that, that would be helpful. So neutrinos have flavor. So what we mean by flavor is essentially how we produce the neutrinos and how we detect them. So for instance, if you produce a neutrino along with an electron or a positron, we'd label this as an electron neutrino. And this is a, what we call a charge current interaction. Now, if you produce the neutrino along with a muon, you call this a muon neutrino. And if you produce it along with a tau, you call it a tau neutrino. So these different flavors are how we produce the neutrinos and how we detect ne the neutrinos. So if we observe an electron and muon or tau, we say the neutrino flavor is an electron muon or tau flavor. Um, so what happens is, and this is a phenomenon that's unique to neutrinos, is that you can produce an electron neutrino. So for instance, you can produce an electron neutrino from the fusion reactions in the sun. This neutrino can travel through the sun and then eight, it takes about eight minutes for it to arrive on earth once it exits the sun. And there's some probability that the neutrino, which was an electron neutrino, has actually transformed to a muon neutrino, which you can detect on earth. So, so this phenomenon of this flavor change is called neutrino oscillations. And this, this only occurs if the neutrinos have masses. Okay, first of all, I want to ask you, um, how do we detect um, that the neutrino change the flavor? And second of all, why is this uh, <laughs> quite crazy to us? Uh, why is this uh, mind boggling? Okay, so, well, maybe let me take one explicit example. Uh, we know that fusion processes release electron-flavored electron neutrinos. 
Um, and there are models for various nuclear fusion reactions in the sun, like a solar model, and they predict a flux of electron neutrinos. Now, these electron neutrinos can then be detected on Earth in large experiments such as Super Kamiokande or the snow detector. Um, and what happens is they'll have transformed, some of them will have transformed to muon neutrinos. So when the muon neutrinos come into the detector, and there are various different ways this occurs, they can essentially produce a muon and the muons detected in the detector. So you know that it was a muon neutrino that arrived. And you know that it, like, if, you've, if you're looking at solar neutrinos with, with that given energy range and flux, you know it's, you're essentially measuring solar neutrinos. But there are different sources of neutrinos that exist in nature. So the actual discovery of neutrino oscillations came from what we call atmospheric neutrinos. Um, I don't know, and I can talk a little bit about how you actually detect um, the, these neutrinos in a specific detector and how this was actually one of the two experiments awarded the Nobel Prize for neutrino oscillation discovery. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so unlike solar neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos, they're produced in the Earth's upper atmosphere, which is between 10 and 30 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Uh, so what happens is cosmic rays, which are really energetic protons or helium from our galaxy or even outside our galaxy, they're accelerated towards us and they hit the atmosphere. And when they hit the atmosphere, they can generate other particles such as pions. And these pions can decay to muons and muon neutrinos. And some of the muons also decay to electrons and electron neutrinos. But in general, when this process happens, most of the neutrinos produced in these atmospheric events are muon neutrinos. Um, so obviously this happens all the way around the Earth. If your detector, let's say we're discussing the Super Kamiokande detector, which I'll discuss in a moment, um, uh, is in Japan, the downward going atmospheric neutrinos only need to travel like about 30 kilometers, whereas the upward going atmospheric neutrinos, which are produced from cosmic rays hitting the other side of the Earth, the opposite side of the Earth, have to travel about 12,000 kilometers to the detector. Um, so the way the detector detects neutrino events is for this particular experiment, uh, they have a 10,000 ton uh, water Sherenkov detector. So what happens is they take this huge cylinder of very pure water and uh, they surround that cylinder with photomultiplier tubes. And so photomultiplier tubes essentially detect radiation. So these atmospheric neutrinos, which can be of the muon flavor or the electron flavor, can come into the water and interact via weak interactions with um, the water and produce muons or electrons. And the muons, what happens is they're traveling faster than the speed of light in the water medium. So it's because the water has some non-trivial refractive index. But let's say the muons and the electrons can travel faster than the speed of light in the water medium. This creates a cone of radiation around that muon or electron that is called a Cherenkov cone. Um, and the way Super Kamiokande can distinguish or did distinguish between a muon neutrino event and an electron neutrino event is because the, muon, the muons produced from the muon neutrino interactions have a very nice clean cone. So the cone's very crisp looking here. This is essentially taking the, the I don't know whether uh, it is my problem or her problem. Yeah, yeah I hope. Uh, okay, with a second, I will uh, stop the recording for the moment. Okay, yes, here we are again. Uh, sorry, we, um, I don't know, there was uh, some um, interruption.
Ah, no problem. Um, can you okay. see my screen now? I, yes. Where did I, okay. I'll, anyway, I was talking about cones. <laughs> yes. Um, so what they found is essentially the muon neutrinos coming from the opposite side of the Earth. They found that there was actually less than they expected. So here in the black is the data. Here in the blue is the prediction of the total amount of atmospheric muon neutrinos they would see. And over here on the x-axis is essentially the neutrinos that were coming the whole way through the Earth. And over here is the neutrinos coming just from the upper atmosphere directly above the experiment. So what happens is they observe less events from the upward going neutrinos. And, and what was happening is these muon neutrinos were actually turning into electron neutrinos or power neutrinos mostly actually. Okay. So, so they, they observed less than they should have over these longer length scales. Okay. Was it, let's say, when was this? Uh, um, I don't remember the, the day when was, uh, the, the, it, of the, the year was 1998. I don't quite know the, the exact date. <laughs> Probably. Okay, I, okay, okay. 1998. Okay. No, okay. I don't think you were uh, already into neutrinos. Uh. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was still a kid, so I wasn't <laughs> around at the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. In Great. physics. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would like to ask you now, um, let's say, how do we, let's say, theorize uh, um, neutrino to have uh, their masses? Uh, and why, let's say, you mentioned before about the uh, standard model, uh, I said about the Higgs field, we know that everything uh, in the universe gets uh, the mass uh, through the Higgs field, uh, right? But how does the neutrino get mass? Because it looks like uh, uh, it, it really does not need the, uh, the Higgs field uh, to get mass, but how is this the case? How do we how do we think this process happens? Okay, so you've already had an episode on the Higgs mechanism, I believe, or yep. um, so I won't recap that. Um, so as you said, other fundamental particles like quarks and charged leptons get their mass um, from the Higgs mechanism. Now it's entirely possible that neutrinos get their mass from the Higgs mechanism. What we would need to do to the standard model, as it currently is, is we would need to add what we call a right-handed neutrino. So, and, and the handedness kind of refers to how the spin aligns with the direction the particle is traveling. Uh, so just to maybe make things more clear for the Higgs mechanism to work, you need different handedness of particles. So how the spin of the particle aligns with the momentum of the particle. It's just at the moment in the standard model, we don't have a right-handed neutrino. Now, many people are a bit skeptical that neutrinos get their mass in this way, precisely because of the reasons we discussed. Neutrinos are just so light compared with the other known particles. So there are many other hypotheses for how neutrinos acquire their mass. And many of those hypotheses actually um, require that neutrinos are Majorana, so the neutrino and the anti-neutrino can be identified. And uh, so there are very many different ways of doing this. There's a lot of research papers on that, but one popular way is called the seesaw mechanism. So to explain why the neutrino is so light, you essentially introduce an extremely heavy particle um, that causes a suppression of the neutrino mass. What is, what is this particle uh, that you introduce? So there are various different particles. So you can have something called a, a very heavy right-handed neutrino. Uh, <laughs> is this the name? Very, uh, very handed, uh, very heavy uh, right-handed neutrino. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a, su <laughs> like a, a super fat particle makes it <laughs> super light particle. Um, or you can have a what we call a scalar particle having the same mechanism. Um, so scalar just means rather than being a spin one half particle, it's this integer spin particle like the photon or the gauge boson or the Higgs boson. Um, so the, the basic idea with these mechanisms is you produce a very light mass through having a very heavy mass. 
And okay. there are lots of experiments searching for indications of these heavy states. Okay. It's just we don't know. We don't know. What What is the most, I'll say, yeah, yeah kind of suitable theory that, um, or at least the way that we theorize uh, um, that do you think it fits the best? I can. So if I said this thing, you know, this model fits the best, then I'd make a lot of because <laughs> it's still a really open question now there are you know different ways of explaining neutrino masses and some of them are more complicated than other ways um so the simplest okay. way is what we call a type one seesaw and like maybe i can okay maybe maybe the, maybe the question should be okay what are we more biased into believing uh, is the actual uh, answer <laughs> Uh, my most biased, well, the <laughs> mechanism I study the most is the type 1 seesaw, uh, which is possibly one of the simplest and people say elegant <laughs> ways of giving neutrinos mass. So you introduce a new spin half particle we call a right handed neutrino, and it doesn't interact with the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, or the electromagnetic force, but it has a very small interaction with neutrinos. And through the presence of its very heavy mass, it produces these extremely light neutrinos. Um, so Francesco, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty because I can't actually see um, you at the moment. All I see is a blank, okay, a blank screen. Um, can you see my slides? Uh, yeah. I, yeah, okay. Sorry, yeah. we can edit that bit out. Yeah. Okay. Now yeah. the screen is not entirely black. Um, no. Yeah. So that is one of the most popular mechanisms, essentially the type one seesaw, where you have this very heavy new particle, and it's called a seesaw because you know essentially the big particle is suppressing the mass of the little particle. Okay. So I want to ask you now. You, you mentioned before. Um, um, I don't remember whether it was a uh, muons uh, or a uh, yeah muons uh, traveling faster than uh, the speed of light um, in water. Yeah, th it, yeah, that's just because they're in water. Yeah, and, okay. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not saying anything travels faster than the speed of light. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, uh, regarding uh, let's say relating or similar to this, uh, I know there was a uh, sort of a wild speculation uh, some mm. uh, some time ago about uh, neutrino traveling faster than the speed of light. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as long as I know uh, about physics uh, and uh, physica physics theories, uh, anything traveling faster than the speed of light, like literally break everything down, okay? Yes. We, yes. we would know nothing about the universe uh, at all. We already know little, but we would know even, even uh, less. Mm -hmm. So what was that about? Uh, why it turned out to be wrong, fortunately, but what what was that the matter? So so this was from what I recall, this was the Opera experiment, which is a, a experiment that was based in Gran Sasso in Italy, actually, and it's on the other side of the Alps from CERN or the where the Large Hadron Collider is based, just outside of Geneva. And what they did is they would have a a neutrino beam. They created the a man made. A neutrino beam, they would send it from CERN to Grand Sasso in Italy through the mountains. And the neutrinos obviously travel through the mountains, no problem, because they don't interact with things very easily. <laughs> and uh, the Opera experiment could detect the neutrinos there. And it seemed like, you know, the distance from CERN to Grand Sasso, and it seems like the neutrinos were arriving faster than they should have and were traveling faster than the speed of light. Because the you know we, we know the distance, we know the time they, they depart, so you can infer the velocity. How, uh, what, what, what was the reason? Uh, so the reason they so my understanding is that the reason they thought that they were traveling faster than the speed of light is because they actually didn't have the, the length distance measured accurately enough. So it was a GPS problem actually. Um, so not so neutrinos were not traveling faster than the speed of light. It was just a measurement problem. Um, so okay. we actually measure the distance from the source to the detector accurately enough. Okay. okay and so of course, this is really like eye catching and was in the media. Um, <laughs> and there were people were saying, you know, maybe neutrinos would travel into other dimensions, and then so they can travel actually shorter distances because they skip through 
our our dimension um okay. by then of, co of course the wildest uh, when there is a uh, uh, yeah and news like this the wildest speculation starts arising yeah of yeah course. but thankfully like that was all settled and yeah there was no surprise there like you know they were <laughs> traveling faster than the speed of light they do travel very fast though but not okay but is, is this speed the does this speed represent let's say um or actually does it have any influence uh, on the detection um is it more difficult less difficult uh, what let's say where does the speed uh, of the neutrinos um, gets into play with regards to the detection so this is a really good question um and you know you can have an everyday analogy so for instance if we make the analogy with billiard balls um how we actually detect the neutrinos is through their weak interactions so they can create electrons or muons and taus depending on their flavor but how you actually observe those electrons muons and taus depends on their momentum or how quickly those particle moves and if they can be produced at all. Um, so for instance, if we have a billiard ball and we, it has a lot of speed and we, we throw it at another billiard ball, we see the other billiard ball shoot off very quickly, right? And maybe that's, that's what we're measuring in order to understand the incoming billiard ball, right? So if neutrinos have enough energy, they can not only create these particles, those particles are then easier to observe in the detectors. So most of the time, neutrinos are traveling ridiculously close to the speed of light, and they can readily produce particles that can be detected. If neutrinos didn't have, if they were moving much slower and had lower momentum, then they couldn't produce electrons, muons, and taus at all, really. So the speed at which they travel does affect their uh, ability to be detected. But pretty much all neutrinos we're familiar with and have detected travel very close to the speed of light. So the ones from the bananas, the ones from the sun, the ones from the atmosphere. The only ones that don't travel very fast, as far as we understand, are the neutrinos that were created a second or so after the Big Bang. These are what we call relic neutrinos. So they were created, you know, more than about 13 billion years ago. And even though they had a lot of energy then, what happens is they lose their, their energy and momentum over time. And they become slower. And, you know, detecting those neutrinos, you can't use conventional methods that we've used before. You would need a new technology. Um, and there are various proposals to do that. And it's very challenging. And for sure, if you could do that, you could understand a lot about the early universe <laughs> and the nature of neutrinos. But yes, the speed of the neutrinos does affect their ability to be detected. Okay, okay. You mentioned uh, you mentioned about relic neutrinos. Uh, I would like to go to come back to that uh, later after we um, uh, touch upon uh, um, sort of a hot topic uh, of these days, uh, which is uh, dark matter. Uh, we know you you previously said um, this is very weird to say self-explanatory and for me sometimes when I think about it it's very humbling that's why I like physics and uh, this kind of stuff because it's very humbling uh, uh, it really puts you uh, I would say it makes you feel very very uh, little exactly your uh, graph uh, your pie chart shows us that our universe uh, is composed of in big in huge majority of dark matter and uh, dark energy almost 95 percent uh, of the mm -hmm. universe uh, and we know how to explain that uh, that little remaining uh, five percent. How let's say do we? If you can give us let's say a small explanation, a brief explanation of what dark matter is, uh, and how can a neutrino actually help us uh, in explain, let's say in explaining and accounting for dark matter? Okay, yeah. So dark matter is the the stuff, the matter. So it has some mass in the universe that it it is crucial for the formation of stars and planets and galaxies because we need dark matter to clump together in order to seed the formation of stars and galaxies and planets that obviously sustain life. Now we know that as you said like 23-24% of the universe the universe's energy budget is comprised of this dark stuff. It's dark in the sense it doesn't interact with light so it has no electric charge um, in addition, it's, it doesn't interact with the strong force, so we know it's not, you know, comprised of protons or neutrons. 
From inference of its gravitational behavior, we know it doesn't interact really strongly with itself. And what's important is that it's been around for a long time. So it, live, it has a long lifetime, as we would say. And it has a long lifetime because we needed it, you know, in the very early universe to actually star or seed the formation of large structures. So these are the fundamental properties of dark matter. But beyond that, we really know nothing about it. Let me ask you, uh, just you mentioned before, uh, um, sorry for the interruption, very quick. You, you said before, uh, we need dark matter to clump together to mm -hmm. allow structure formation. Um, can you elaborate very quickly on um, what do we mean by a type of matter that we do not know, we cannot see this type of matter to clump together? What do we mean by that? Right, okay. So this refers, so matter is essentially fundamental stuff. Uh, that has mass. Um, so we know that the dark matter is there and that it doesn't readily interact with the forces we're familiar with in the standard model. And very early in the universe, the, this matter would be sort of clumped together in what say like certain patches of space would have more dark matter than other patches of space. So all I mean is like in a certain interval range, let's say it's just a one-dimensional interval range we're considering. In some, in some volume of space. In some volume, there's yeah. just much more dark matter mass, right? Okay. So we'd say that's an over-density of dark matter. So in the universe, it wasn't completely uniform. A long time ago, there were these patches of over-densities and under-densities of dark matter. And the patches which had more dark matter or the volumes which had more dark matter in them, they would gravitationally, you know, they would have gravitational interactions and they would encourage more dark matter to clump in there through okay. the attractive force of gravity. And okay. these over densities can then grow and grow and grow over time. And that's what um, gives rise to the stars and um, various structures we observe in the universe. Okay, you mentioned that uh, just now, um, we can see the the distribution of that matter was not very uniform in the early universe. Uh, how do we know that? Well, what, by from where uniform, can we I mean it's not like completely the same density over the whole of space. Now, it, if it was completely the same density over the whole of space, you wouldn't get patches that had more or less dark matter. And that's crucial for more of it to aggregate to form the large scale structures. So if it was completely uniform, the density of dark matter in the early universe, you wouldn't get the subsequent formation of large scale structures that we observe now. Okay, and how, like, this is a fact that we infer theoretically from our explanation of dark matter, or is it something that we can uh, sort of uh, probe or see from some, yeah, from some observation uh, that we can claim, yes, the distribution of yeah. dark matter, there were patches uh, of that, of, I would say, of, yeah, there were patches of the universe with more dark matter and less dark matter. And so it is so, something that from uh, experimentally. Yeah, so you can observe the power spectrum, um, which sort of tells you about these um, patches from cosmic microwave background radiation, but you can also, you can also simulate large scale structure formation and that's how much of the much of the um confrontation with data is is done through these simulations where you have like some initial den densities over densities and under densities of dark matter and then you have gravitational interactions and you simulate how the dark matter is clumping together and the subsequent distribution of large scale structures you would have so it's something you can generally simulate but also observe in the cosmic microwave background radiation okay how do uh, let's say going back um, to our neutrino explanation how do neutrino help us uh, accounting for this dark matter why do, are they considered to be a possible explanation oh that's that's a very cool animation if you okay can yes that is not my <laughs> my animation but it's an animation of a simulation of large-scale structure formation so the more blue parts are the blue parts with the higher density of dark matter that seed the formation of these structures so that's what the uh, the uh, image shows um so how how are neutrinos important for large-scale structure formation or how do they contribute to dark matter um, so neutrinos can't be dark matter, 
Uh, they certainly can't be the whole of dark matter. The reason they can't be dark matter is because in the early universe, when they first were created, these relic neutrinos, they had a high speed. And if dark matter had a high speed in the early universe, it's not going to clump together and form these large scale structures we can observe and um, also gain from understand from simulation. But neutrinos can form a very small, small subcomponent of dark matter, less than 1%, and we call we would classify them as hot dark matter. And the reason they're hot is because they move really fast in the early universe. So we would say they were hot. Um, now, they can affect large-scale structure formation. And what actually happens is that when these relic neutrinos were created, they free stream. Um, so they're not in contact with the early universe matter or plasma as it was, right? So they, they just fly through the universe. But as they're free streaming, they can have gravitational interactions with the plasma because they do have a mass and therefore they will feel the force of gravity if somewhat um, weakly. Now, when they interact with the plasma at these stages of large scale structure formation, they can actually, what they do is they remove some of the large scale structure. So as you have these over densities of dark matter and you get more dark matter falling into these patches of space, because the neutrinos are hot and they move around very quickly, they can actually smooth out the over densities you have. So they can remove large scale structure if they're which is, too- Which is yeah. not what we observe. Yeah, exactly. And so what you can, but they only remove the large scale structures on small scales. So not okay. over the whole universe and not over the whole universe because neutrinos, although they travel fast, they're not traveling at the speed of light and also the universe is expanding. So from simulations, you can predict the power spectrum or the matter over densities. And what you find is that if you increase the masses of the neutrinos, you actually suppress how much over densities you have, or you suppress the matter power spectrum at so-called small scales. So if you had, uh, this is actually a way of constraining the total neutrino mass in um, using these large scale structure simulations. So they would okay. remove the large scale structure and they would disrupt it. Okay. But only over certain distance scales. Okay. Well, let's see what are the, Sort of the consequences, uh, yeah, not consequences, let's say the advantages uh, of, uh, let's say, this theorized uh, model for dark matter. Let's say, what is the advantage, or what is, at the end of the day, what the benefit uh, with regards to physical theory that we rip off from this neutrino dark matter connection? Right. So, neutrinos for sure are a subcomponent, a tiny subcomponent of dark matter that's hot. They're not all the dark matter, but as you said, people have explored the connection between neutrinos and dark matter. So for instance, does dark matter just interact with neutrinos? And that's why we've not observed it, right? Um, so these, the motivations for these theories is that neutrinos are extremely weakly interacting, and we've not observed dark matter yet, so obviously it also interacts weakly with ordinary matter. So that's kind of the motivation. Now, the benefit is there may be astrophysical signatures. So for instance, if dark matter interacts with neutrinos, you might produce uh, neutrinos of maybe certain energy ranges you can actually measure in patches of the universe with high density of dark matter. And there have been lots of these theories that have um, you know, made these connections and they've been constrained by, by data. So I would say the main advantage is you would get an astrophysical signature of the neutrinos that might come from the dark matter. And the motivation is essentially the weakness of the interactions, uh, both in the neutrinos and the dark matter. Okay. Uh, my intuition uh, um, with regards to this, uh, this sort of connection tells me that uh, it is not a super popular theory if uh, I think that our, let's say, most popular and widely used cosmological model uh, is called uh, lambda CDM, which means a uh, cold dark matter and mm -hmm. not uh, hot dark matter. Do you think? Uh, mm -hmm. So do you think? Uh, I say, is it is it true that uh, let's say we have not been uh, adopting uh, this model um, or this connection uh, uh, of neutrino and dark matter? I think, I, as you said, lambda CDM assumes 
well, it, it, you know, it's based on dark matter being cold, so, so it's not moving around fast, so it can clump together and form large scale structures. And of course, we know neutrinos can't do that. Um, I mean, another disadvantage of making this connection is that from a practical point of view, if neutrinos are the only way that dark matter interacts with the visible world, then that's really tough because <laughs> neutrinos are really tough to detect. <laughs> So people are typically more interested in uh, theories where we can actually have some hope to detect them. Okay. okay. Now, it, it may be possible that, you know, dark matter does interact with neutrinos, but again, it's very challenging to actually confront that theory from because neutrinos are difficult to detect. Okay. What, do, what do you said, think about, um, um, you mentioned before about higher dimension for the speed of the neutrino, but I do know that there are some sort of um, clearly speculation, but uh, yeah, some thoughts that maybe dark matter, or at least this is actually what I like to, not to believe, but uh, <laughs> let's say to think sometimes, uh, every once in a to think, okay, maybe if we cannot detect uh, so much of the universe uh, with regards to dark matter and uh, later with dark energy, but maybe isn't it that we are just limited there? Uh, with regards to the medium that we use and that we can exploit, but also with regards to the dimension that we can actually probe the universe in. Meaning, uh, what if dark matter exists or interacts or um, yeah, kind of has to do with uh, other dimensions uh, other than the three dimensional space and the one of time that we know? Yeah, I mean, that may be the case. Um, <laughs> in, those, in those theories, you kind of need to explain how you made the dark matter typically. So that's why people like focusing on the theories which have interactions between the stuff we're made of and can, you know, ordinary matter and things we can build detectors from and the dark matter. Because somehow in the early universe, you must have made dark matter. Right. So typically you, you know, in the most popular or well-studied theories, you use the standard model particles to essentially build your abundance of dark matter in the early universe. Now, it may be that, you know, there are now dark matter is completely dark. I think this is the hypothesis you were uh, saying. And it, by completely dark, we mean it has zero interactions with the standard model. And that can totally be the case. There are many theories that propose this is the fact, in fact, True. Now, this it would be very challenging to actually then directly detect dark matter because the only way we could detect it then is through its gravitational interactions, right? Which, of course, gravity is a very weak force. It's an attractive force, but it's a very weak force. So yeah. this is also possible. We just hope it's not the case. <laughs> at least <laughs> as, as a phenomenologist, I would hope to see the phenomena manifest at some, at some time. Uh, and if, you know, Dark matter is totally dark. It would be really challenging uh, mm -hmm. to detect that. Well, I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be your problem uh, for the future years. Uh, to yeah, it keeps people busy. <laughs> 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 and it's, it's a fascinating problem, and it keeps us all puzzling. Um, <laughs> you mentioned before, um, Jessica, about a signature um, that we can probe, and with, say regarding to this, I, I would like to ask you. What is the, which is something that I was reading about, uh, what is the cosmic neutrino background? And um, which it has something to do with the particle you were mentioning before, which are relic neutrinos. So what is this uh, background, which kind of looks, sounds like uh, the cosmic microwave background. So mm, we could have uh, already a grasp a hint of what is it. Is it composed of relic neutrinos? What are these neutrinos? How do they differ? from normal neutrinos, let's say. Okay, yeah, so have you covered what the cosmic microwave background radiation is with your list? Yes, I did, I did. Okay. Yeah, you, can, you, can, you can introduce it in little one sentence, I think. Uh, um, so it is the radiation that fills the universe and it's of the microwave frequency. And by radiation, I mean photons. Yeah, so the first light, the first light that we could see after the universe became... Yes. Uh, of that. Okay. Yeah. So basically, the, these photons were created three hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, and they give us a snapshot of the universe at that time. And a lot of our knowledge of the universe comes from measurements of the properties of the cosmic microwave background radiation. 
Now, the cosmic neutrino background are these relic neutrinos that we were discussing. So neutrinos were what we would say in, in thermal contact with the early universe plasma. So neutrinos were interacting with the rest of the standard model particles and very fast in the early universe. And of course, the only way they interact is through weak interactions. So a neutrino and an electron can a neutrino, an electron neutrino and an electron can interact with the W and the W can scatter away. And this was happening very fast. But at some point, these interactions couldn't happen fast enough because the universe is expanding and particles are getting further and further apart. And then those neutrinos decouple or take a snapshot of the universe and they lose thermal contact with the early universe plasma or soup of particles. And then they would free stream or just continue their journey in the universe out of thermal contact with that soup of particles. So that, that process of decoupling, neutrino decoupling occurred about a second after the Big Bang. And it's those neutrinos that constitute the cosmic neutrino background. Okay, what is that? So you're telling me that basically we have uh, the cosmic microwave, microwave background, which is uh, 380,000 uh, years after the Big Bang. And uh, you are telling me that we have neutrinos uh, from a second after the Big Bang. Yes, yes. Okay, this is interesting, uh, then. Uh, yes. please, uh, and please go on. the whole universe. Okay. So so in, in, a, in a, a teacup, there's about 6,000 of these neutrinos that were created one second after the Big Bang. Okay. And so they're say, all over. <laughs> okay, but what, what do I say? What, okay, first of all, what um, an image, what a, a cosmic uh, a neutrino background may tell us, uh, and let's say, what role uh, would we infer the neutrino played uh, in the early universe, because let's say one of the big questions is uh, what happened uh, at the Big Bang. Okay, what what can we know about neutrinos uh, from these uh, erratic neutrinos? About so the I think yeah. right. So if we could really detect these relic neutrinos and have a number of events, we could kind of get maybe as much information as the CMB could tell us. But it's really easy to detect photons um, rather than neutrinos. So. In principle, you could understand like the state of the early universe at that one second. I think there are very interesting things you can understand about neutrinos themselves, though, if you detected the cosmic neutrino background or a relic neutrino. So this would actually be a way to probe the nature of neutrinos. So you could tell the difference between Majorana neutrinos or whether neutrinos were Dirac particles, like the other spin half particles, if you could detect a sample of relic neutrinos because what happens is that actually the detection rate so how many neutrinos you detect uh, is twice as many for Majorana neutrinos than it is for Dirac neutrinos okay. in, in most of these experimental setups to detect that so actually detection of relic neutrinos would help us distinguish um, the nature of neutrinos I think that's the most interesting thing we could gain from detecting um, relic neutrinos, although okay. it's extremely challenging. So they were created one second after the Big Bang, and they had very high momentum or velocity equivalently, but the universe expands. And so what we would say is the momentum gets redshifted. So just as, a, um, you know, if you have a, a wave, if you stretch the space the wave occupies, the wavelength gets longer. Equivalently, like the momentum of the neutrinos would get reduced if you know as space expands so what happens now is that these cosmic neutrino background can be non-relativistic which is which means that they're not the neutrinos no longer have a high momentum in fact they can have quite a low momentum and they're moving very slowly relative, yeah, how, right okay but how can these okay they are i mean neutrinos do move at very very very, very close to the speed of light but then these red shift has to be a sort of quite drastic uh, because uh, if you yeah. have to bring a new day speed from relativistic to non-relativistic uh, then it's pretty big hell of a redshift <laughs> it's a big hell of a redshift but there's many there's like 13 billion years time almost to, to do that so the, <laughs> so, right. so like this has actually slow, slowed it you know the, those relic neutrinos down which is why it's really hard to detect them okay because as we were discussing, like with the billiard balls, if how I measure the presence of a billiard ball is by observing the outgoing billiard ball, 
and that's the only handle I have on the, the billiard ball that comes in, then it's really hard to detect almost a not moving billiard ball. So you need other technologies to actually do that from the technologies we currently have, but there are proposals. Okay. And um, what about, what about um, uh, neutrino oscillations uh, inside and uh, yeah, explanation that we can gain from the, the cosmic neutrino background? Uh, is there any, let's say, sort of a spillover effect in uh, explanation that we can read from uh, this neutrino picture uh, with regards to neutrino oscillations? So the detection of relic neutrinos will depend on their mass, their overall mass, and we don't know the overall mass scale of neutrinos from neutrino oscillation experiments. So if we could, in principle, detect relic neutrinos, that would give us a handle on the total mass of neutrinos, which would essentially feed into our, our kind of ignorance about general uh, neutrino properties. But neutrino oscillations which depend on the masses, the mass differences between the neutrino states and something called their mixing can be measured relatively well at oscillation experiments, but we don't know the overall mass scale of neutrinos. So we know the difference between the masses from the oscillation experiments, but we don't know how heavy or how light the lightest neutrino is. Right. And you know, if in principle you can measure relic neutrinos, you can actually get a handle on how heavy or light the lightest mass is. And this can then be used in inputs for oscillation experiments, et cetera. Okay. Okay. And what is it about the role uh, neutrino uh, played in, uh, or plays uh, in uh, yeah, the formation of large scale structure? You mentioned before that we surely know, we surely are convinced that actually that um, dark matter has played uh, plays a role uh, in large structure formation. Uh, do neutrino uh, play a role in this? So as I was saying, like the large scale structure formation comes from these over densities and under, well, generally over densities of dark matter. And you might ask, why do you have over densities in the first place? Well, this is actually a prediction of inflation. Right. So why, like you said, it was a really good question. Like, why don't you just have a uniform density of dark matter? Why do you have these patches where there's more or less? This is a prediction of inflation. Now, as the clumps grow, neutrinos, because they're very hot or they're whizzing around very quickly in the early universe, they can actually smooth out those clumps and make the universe less clumpy in terms of its matter distribution. So neutrinos can affect large and large scale structure formation over what we call small scales, which are still very huge distances in terms of the universe. Okay. So you can, you can essentially from the distribution of matter, you can infer the total mass of the neutrinos from their effect on large scale structure formation. Okay. Do you believe, uh, do you believe inflation uh, is accurate, uh, is very accurate as a theory or is it, Oh, actually, sorry, it's not phrase properly. Do you think inflation is the truth or is sort of a proxy theory that it works? We know it explains a lot of stuff, but yeah, you sort of have the conviction uh, within you, deeply within you, that it's not the actual truth. There is more to it. I, so inflation is a class of theories that explains the accelerated expansion required at the start of the universe, right? And you probably covered this with other guests who maybe work on inflation. I, But there are lots of specific models within this larger inflationary mechanism, right? So I think inflation as a class of models is very convincing and explains a lot of the data we observe from the CMB. So there... I don't know of any model or class of models that are a reasonable alternative to inflationary models. Like there's the big crunch, the big bang, the big crunch um, proposals, but I don't think they're very convincing in all honesty. So I'm not a cosmologist, I don't work in inflation, but I, I think in, generally the inflationary mechanism explains a bunch of phenomena extremely well. So yeah, I do. I try to be agnostic, really, yeah. <laughs> as, as I can be, and just work on things um, and, you know, see how the theories confront the data. But I do think inflation is very convincing. But, of course, some models of inflation are more convincing than others. Okay. Um, but in general, inflation, yeah, I think is a reasonable explanation for how the universe 
Okay. Yeah. And what what do you think about uh, eternal eternal inflation? Um, I I have to say like I don't want to wobble. I I actually am not too familiar with those theories because I I'm not really a cosmologist like so to speak. So I don't want to comment too much about them if that's okay. I like, just want some. I'll say something that out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I, I do. I don't know. I think uh, sometimes, sometimes there are. Um, as you said, there are many models, uh, uh, many inflationary models, and I, I gotta say, for example, in the eternal inflation uh, does not really, let's say, satisfy me. Not with regards to the thing that it can explain, but with regards to the fact that um, it really gives me a very bad feeling uh, that, like, for sure, our universe, at least our observable universe, uh, must be embedded uh, in something else. And eternal inflation just says. There is like our universe is embedded in something else. Uh, we don't know what is it. It's a terrible inflation. Yeah, and, I suppose ah. the the uh, is not very satisfactory as a <laughs> like there. There's just something unknowable. Um, yeah, so I can I can get on board with the unease that it generates within you. Um, but yeah, I'm not familiar enough with the details to make like a really kind of informed comment on that. Okay, uh, yeah, I, j- I just want some uh, low key speculation. Uh, so that <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be too political, like, too politically <laughs> Okay, so I would like I would like now to ask you, um, start uh, start wrapping it up. Uh, we know, uh, or let's say, mathematicians uh, do appreciate uh, a lot uh, symmetries, and um, we know that. Uh, uh, Physicists, uh, they do spot. Uh, they do spot a lot of uh, symmetries uh, in our physical theories and in our uh, universe. Uh, so I would like to ask you, what is uh, the so-called uh, CP uh, symmetry? And subsequently, I would like to ask you, why is there something uh, due to a violation uh, of symmetries? Because at the end of the day, it sounds like uh, if everything was perfectly symmetric uh, from the beginning of, yeah, let's say time, uh, if it is um, accurate to say, if everything was perfectly symmetric, uh, then we probably would not be here talking about uh, symmetries and asymmetries. So what is CP asymmetry? What is, does it mean uh, for a, a CP violation to take place? Uh, and why is there something instead of nothing due to asymmetry or a symmetry violation? Okay, yeah, it's, it's a very kind of fascinating topic. It's something I re- research on. So in a very kind of broad sense, CP violation says that matter and antimatter behave differently, right? So in general, like strong interactions and electromagnetic interactions don't, don't violate CP, but it may be that weak interactions in the neutrino sector violate CP. And that is just saying matter and antimatter behave in fundamentally different ways. Okay. Now, the reason we would require CP violation from an observational standpoint is that we know from our universe's pie chart that there's matter, us, stars, galaxies, etc. Um, but there's no appreciable amounts of antimatter in the universe. So there is more matter than antimatter. And therefore, there must have been some interactions which bias for the production of matter over antimatter. And that is encapsulated in CP violation, because if CP symmetry was conserved, then matter and antimatter would behave exactly the same way, and there would be an overall equal amount of matter and antimatter in the universe. Okay. Let's say the, the problem that you said, um, the problem that you mentioned, uh, the, that we can observe, uh, indeed, uh, um, it is the abundance of uh, matter over antimatter. This is... Uh, um, right, mm-hmm. called as uh, known as a uh, baryogenesis. Uh, yes. So right. theories that explain the asymmetry are called baryogenesis. Baryogenesis. Okay. And how do let's say how do neutrinos help us in uh, let's say explaining uh, or helping with the baryogenesis? So how do they tell us uh, let's say some way that for some yeah unknown reason there was more matter than antimatter in our so, okay yeah so baryogenesis is any mechanism that produces essentially more matter than antimatter, which is what we observe. And there are many theories, but 
many popular theories are connected with neutrinos and how neutrinos get their tiny masses. So the, and this class of theories is called leptogenesis. So the idea is that whatever mechanism explained why neutrinos are so light, in the early universe, essentially you can generate more, pos uh, more positrons than electrons. So more um, counterintuitively, more anti-leptons than leptons, but there are processes in the standard model that can convert the fact you have more anti-leptons than leptons into more baryons than anti-baryons, which is actually what we observe. And for that to happen, you need CP violation, which is of course the fact that whatever generates the leptony symmetry, so more anti-leptons than leptons, can tell the difference between matter and antimatter, i.e. why you got more leptons and uh, more anti-leptons than leptons in the first place. And so theories of leptogenesis is that essentially they can explain why neutrino masses are light, what is the nature of neutrinos, are they, for instance, Majorana or Dirac, and how did you dynamically generate more matter than antimatter? And you need CP violation for that. Okay. Um, so, and, and, you know, the fact we have more matter than antimatter is really important, right, for the, for our existence. Yeah, I, I, I will ask you, I will ask you immediately later, um, I just want to um, say, ask you what, uh, first, uh, what um, neutrino oscillation, uh, let's say, can help and can help us uh, in, um, yeah, let's say, explaining, uh, or actually, why do we think uh, that neutrino oscillations uh, provide us some uh, hints uh, on, um, yeah, of CP mm -hmm. violation uh, and, um, yeah, in the neutrino sector? Why do we think? Okay, that's a really good question. And uh, okay, so what would CP violation look like in the neutrino sector and what are experimental, experimentalists measuring? Well, for instance, if you can make muon neutrinos at experiments, you can send the muon neutrino beam, let's say a few hundred kilometers and detect it. And on its travels, some of the muon neutrinos will have transformed to electron neutrinos through the phenomenon of neutrino oscillations. Now, if neutrinos and anti-neutrinos, or if matter and antimatter were behaving exactly the same way, then the amount of muon neutrinos that convert to electron neutrinos would be the same as the amount of anti-muon neutrinos transforming to anti-electron or electron anti-neutrinos. So the matter process versus the antimatter process, if CP was conserved in neutrino oscillations, would be identical. And the, the experimentalist can actually measure the how many neutrino muon neutrinos oscillate to electron neutrinos versus how many muon antineutrinos oscillate to um, electron antineutrinos. And they can tell if there's a difference between th these rates, essentially. And if there was a difference, there would be CP violation. And there are two experiments that are doing this. Uh, there's T2K, which is based in Japan. And then there is NOVA, which is based in the US. And unfortunately, in the moment, or fortunately, because it makes things very interesting, there is a slight disagreement. So in T2K, they have a preference for CP violation. So the rate of muon neutrinos transforming to electron neutrinos is very different from the, the rate of the antimatter process. So it looks like CP is violated. But NOVA, which is um, and based in the US actually prefers CP conservation. So there's not much of a difference in the rates. So at the moment, there's not really a consensus in the neutrino community if CP is violated or not. So it makes it a very interesting time actually. Um, and the reason, yeah. So we have to wait some years so that the experiments can collect more data and we can actually determine if CP is violated in the neutrino sector. And the reason that's interesting is because you can make connections between that CP violation and this, the CP violation needed to generate the matter-antimatter asymmetry. But I should put a caveat, just because you measure CP violation from neutrino experiments doesn't immediately mean that that is the explanation for the observed okay. matter-antimatter asymmetry. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying in specific models, you can uh, essentially do a consistency test and ask the question, is there a relation? And what is the strength of that relation? Okay, and I want to go back um, immediately to the thing we were talking before. Indeed, that 
and now like being uh, there being uh, something uh, instead of nothing uh, due to an asymmetry in something. Do you find this? Uh, because I, I like a lot of uh, mathematics, uh, so I do tend to appreciate uh, symmetries uh, wherever uh, I see them uh, through some textbook or uh, in some uh, subject, whatever. But don't you think, Adrian, I feel like uh, it is very weird, uh, very strange uh, that there is sort of a, <laughs> let's put it away, Statis in statistical terms, uh, we have a random variable uh, which outcomes uh, uh, an observed data. And this observed data is such that uh, it's possible uh, only because uh, there was uh, a, yeah, there was not uh, a perfect uh, symmetric uh, framework. Uh, to me, this is uh, sort of ironic because uh, it makes me understand, okay, but if there was all symmetries, if, there, if it was all symmetric, then we would not be seeing uh, complexity, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how is possible that complexity arises uh, from asymmetry, which is what people do not actually appreciate? We do appreciate uh, symmetry, which is uh, the framework under which we would not be able, uh, capable to appreciate uh, symmetry. How th that to me kind of say makes me boggles uh, a little bit. I say, what? How is it? How is it possible? How do we explain it? <laughs> like as, as you say, symmetries are very beautiful. You know, we can encapsulate them in mathematical ways and you know we can understand symmetries very nicely from a mathematical framework and they also appeal to us aesthetically right it's much easier for our minds to grasp something symmetric than something completely disordered um but there's just so much symmetry breaking in nature is you know <laughs> it's just part of nature right disorder and symmetry breaking is part of nature um okay. Like, for instance, the Higgs mechanism, you're actually breaking a symmetry there. In order to generate mass from the Higgs mechanism, you are, you are breaking a symmetry. Um, so even though symmetries can be a guiding principle, and there are certain symmetries of nature which are sacrosanct, like um, to, to all intents and purpose, purposes, CP and T, um, which is CP, in the addition with a time reversal symmetry is, is uh, respected by all sort of quantum field theories, many symmetries are kind of there to be broken. <laughs> so, right. just, and we require that symmetry to be broken. Um, well, we don't require it, but it's, we're, we're very fortunate that it is, right? Because <laughs> if there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter, they would annihilate and you would just have a universe filled with light, right? Which is maybe aesthetically more, it is more simple, right? <laughs> no photons and no matter, you know, no stars, no galaxies yet. And you don't get the complex structures we observe in life and, you know, all these sorts of wonderful things. So this is, this is quite ironic. I swear, yeah. this is, uh, if I think the more, the more I try to yeah, shrug my head around it, uh, the more I, it's, it is ironic. It, it really is uh, not making no sense. Uh, it looks like it is a joke. It really looks like uh, someone is messing around. It's a joke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It looks like uh, the, I don't know, the, I, who was uh, naming, uh, yeah, probably every, almost every physicist uh, naming God uh, as a mathematician. Uh, the God mathematician uh, who put in place all of this uh, really likes to play around, uh, to mess around with us, I think. Yeah, I mean, it is quite, as you say, a lot of it seems very arbitrary. Like the structures, for example, for exa example, the standard model. So the particles and forces, we can encapsulate that mathematically. Um, and you can ask the question, but why that particular mathematical structure is? Exactly. Why, why does it have this structure at all? Exactly. Why are parts of it broken? Um, you know, why are parts of the symmetry broken? Uh, but I suppose it leads to interest, yeah, interesting phenomena, complex phenomena. Yeah. Phenomenal, um, at least I was sitting discussing it. <laughs> <laughs> we can see then uh, talk about. But yeah, the, the, the thing you said also, um, yeah, as you say, enlightens me another another question which I sometimes try to read and watch uh, videos about, which is uh, the, um, I think there is a series called uh, This Way, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. Mm -hmm. The fact that um, we can explain uh, everything in, a, in this language, uh, is quite uh, mesmerizing to me. The fact that um, we literally can trace uh, 
everything i mean the standard model right explains that basically every physical phenomena that has happened so far basically almost every physical phenomena so at a certain length scale yes yeah. Yes. At a certain length scale. So but getting back to the idea of complexity at longer length scales or, or lower energies, you know, you, you actually can model the behavior from a ab initio or first principles structure, right? Like, you know, certain like nuclear interactions, you don't really have a really first principle way of doing that, like a very fundamental way of doing that, like in the standard model. So I would say at certain scales, like, yes. You know, things are, you know, physical phenomena are more simple to explain. Which makes me, what you just now pointed out, uh, makes me, I would say, makes me ponder, uh, makes me contemplate uh, another uh, sort of um, related question, uh, which is, uh, okay, if I think about, uh, let's say, uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics, uh, I say, okay, general relativity, we explain at a very big, uh, whatever we know what uh, a very big scale uh, is, going, uh, is going on, uh, quantum mechanics uh, at a very, uh, little scale mm -hmm. and now <laughs> if you think about it uh, again it's very ironic that we the person who are capable of contemplating uh, these two different scales uh, we are li like, literally in the middle of these two we are not uh, our mind is not uh, uh con not conjecture it's not wired to understand neither of the scale because literally it's it's quite funny when uh, i see um videos uh, of physicists uh, talking about, ah, yes, because at Planck scale, at 10 to the minus 44, okay, like, it's just a number, it doesn't mean anything, okay, it literally doesn't mean anything, like, it's not that my brain is capable of saying, ah, okay, 10 to the minus 44 is this small, okay, thank you very much, no, I cannot understand it, okay, our brain is just incapable, okay, and I think that we are precisely in the middle, not to understand neither of those, but just to understand the apparently, how do you say, apparently banal and common, and I think, um, I think easy to explain, Thing, uh, let's say scales that we live uh, in our daily life, uh, this mm -hmm. was very ironic. And um, I don't know, a, a lot of uh, thoughts uh, to <laughs> wrap your yeah, mind. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really nice point, actually. Like, oh, we can most easily understand the length scales that, in which we exist. The, the very large length scales, you know, galactic, extra galactic, extra galactic, you need really sophisticated methods. And of course, they're very tiny scales you know you not you not only need very high energies but you also need a certain you know power to understand that like intellectual power and we're still progressing in that direction so yeah we're, it would be ideal to be able to understand the extremes um which i think is the appealing part of physics and mathematics right that's ultimately <laughs> <laughs> what we want to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it still it still makes me wonder, right? I still find it fascinating. I do. And what uh, what is that? Uh, sorry, what is that? Uh, do you what do you think about um, uh, the speed of light? Because sometimes uh, this is uh, another uh, <laughs> question which uh, I like. Uh, I, I don't know if you could notice, but I like uh, I don't know asking questions which completely have no answer at all. Uh, no one has <laughs> answered that. Just try to think, okay, what, uh, what if, what, uh, but what I sometimes uh, like to wonder is that, not like to wonder, is that if you think about the speed of light, uh, it looks like uh, um, quite limiting. I know it may, <laughs> I say it may be not controversial, but sounds uh, sort of um, not accurate, superficial uh, to say this, uh, but if you think about it, uh, we already know uh, the universe, uh, the actual universe uh, is much bigger than what we know that we can observe, the size of our observable universe. I was listening to, I think, Leonard Susskind uh, when he went to Lex Friedman uh, podcast, uh, and he talked about uh, the fact that we know if there is an estimate, uh, the, sort of the estimate that we made uh, is that the universe uh, should be, should actually be around 200, uh, 250 times uh, greater than the observable universe. That it was an estimate uh, which has been made. Mm -hmm. And my thoughts uh, with regards to this uh, is okay we can see literally to, through the light through electromagnetic waves uh, gravitational waves but the ultimate speed uh, such that these mediums uh, are communicated to us uh, is the speed of light mm -hmm. it's quite uh, limiting uh, it's mm, it doesn't really satisfy me like i know there is much more i know there is much much more that we cannot see and at the current uh, at the current moment uh, we have at all instrument or medium such that uh, to go and probe uh, 
the other part that we know is there, we just don't have the medium to see it. What do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of one of those things that's just it's so well accepted, you know, like the, the speed of light, well, at least in my mind, is like the, it is the universe's upper speed limit, right? You And you really, it's not like in a car where you can, you know, test the speed limit and you go above yeah. it. There might be a penalty if you're unlucky. Um, but this is like written into the laws of nature. And yeah, it's interesting to think like why three times 10 to the eight meters per second? Like it, it is very fast, but at the same time, like why not more? And that would allow us to see for further and deeper into the universe. Um, but yeah, I get what you mean when you say it is frustrating that there is this upper limit and it is really a law of nature. Um, so, yeah, it would be awesome if that wasn't the case, but unfortunately it is. And even, it's interesting you mention about um, photons, that's one of the primary ways we look into the universe, but actually very high energy photons, uh, the probability they can reach us can actually go down quite a lot because they'll interact with the electromagnetic background light in the universe. So you have like a very high energy photon from, let's say, a quasar, many kilo, mega, megaparsecs away from us. It can actually like hit the, the B field that permeates the, the universe and convert to electron positrons. So we can't even see that very high energy photon. So the universe isn't exactly transparent um, to photons. Uh, and that kind of brings me to my other point, like neutrinos can be very useful in that regard. So unlike photons, which can interact with this uh, background, um, neutrinos won't, and they can actually come towards us. So neutrinos are, in addition to photons, a very important probe of the universe. But again, they are they are limited from above in terms of their speed. Um, okay, hopefully. Hopefully you may come back uh, here and tell, uh, tell us a bit about the last recent uh, development about uh, getting faster than light neutrinos. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would really throw a spanner in the works and be super interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we can, uh, we can wrap it up uh, here, Jessica. It's an amazing conversation. Thank you very much for your time and the uh, explanation. It was uh, everything uh, very extremely fascinating and interesting. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your time and excitement. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for reaching out. The conversation's been fantastic. And it's actually been really inspiring and meaningful for me to think about your questions. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. It's been really great. And I now I, I'm aware of the podcast. I will be tuning in for uh, your conversations with future guests. Great. Thank you very much uh, again, Jessica. And uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, following uh, along with us this was um, uh, math and beyond and then this podcast uh, i will see you in the next episode Ciao. okay you take care francesco ciao